Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is City Works, the show by, with, and for workers in New York City. We talk about their work and the issues they face on the job and in their communities. City Works is a production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. On today's show, Beverly Brakeman, Regional Director of UAW Region 9A here in the Northeast, on the UAW strike at General Motors and its significance for the nation, and New York Central Labor Council President Vinnie Alvarez on what feels like it could be a new moment for labor. All that and Subway Soprano Alexis Krager. Have a listen. First up, something of immediate interest to most New Yorkers, where they get their food. For many of us, we're talking about food vendors. There are an estimated 10 to 20,000 street vendors in New York City. Some have city permits, others don't. They're all out to make a living, though, and behind each living, a story. Here's Demetria Irwin with our report. Um, so at 3 in the morning, prep starts. We um, are here by 5.30, so it takes two and a half hours to prep. Um, once we get here at 5.30 in the morning, we start taking out everything, setting everything up. I mean, it's a little hectic getting everything prepared. We boil the tamales in the morning. We pack them up so that they stay warm and hot all the, throughout the day. For the most part, it's become normal now, the, the routine of waking up super early and getting things ready and done. Stephanie is a third-generation street vendor. She, like her mother, aunt, and grandmother, make their living as street food vendors. Well, I think my grandma is extremely resilient. She's, uh, you know, she was an orphan. She lost her mom at four. She left her house at eight or nine years old from Arequipa to Lima with her sister. Um, started her first business at 13 and um, has always been working since then. Na mesa, ahí comencé a vender yo. Sábado y domingo nos íbamos ahí y ahí vendía porque no conocía, tenía que partir los tamales, invitarles para que lo compren. Las empanadas también tenía que partirlas, e invitarles y así me compraba. Pero vendía sábado y domingo. Trabajé así como cuatro años. Fue duro, pero lo, lo hicimos. En compañía de mis hijas todos trabajamos. Todos trabajamos. Mi nieta también ayudó bastante. Es una unión, la unión hace la fuerza, así es. I've been doing this like eight years. My mother started, and then we started doing this. Sometimes you don't feel the time, you just walk, work and work, and then the time goes, even in the winter, it's a little, it's a little harder because of the winter. Karina Gutierrez is deputy director of the Street Vendor Project. So vendors are often operating in places where there's not fresh, affordable food and where folks are working really long hours. Like I live off of 74th Street in Jackson Heights. I get off the subway, I can get the tamales for $2. We started to have clientele, people that frequently came over, orders and things like that. And that's when the family started to work. That's when my mother started to work in here, my aunt and myself and my uncle. Some must buy permits on a black market that can run as much as $25,000 for what legally sells for $200. If you have access to a permit, it costs $200, but there is no access to permits right now. So people who want to sell food, right now you can only get a permit on the black market, and those are honestly between $20,000, $25,000. It's wild. Dona Fiella imagined she could do better on the streets of New York, so she left her home of Peru for Jackson Heights, Queens. She knew her tamales were special. It's bigger um, than the usual, like the tamales that people usually think of, but it's it's super flavorful. So Jackson Heights has a big South Asian, Middle Eastern area that's more in the 70s, and street vendors there sell things for their community. Um, the food is of their community, and where we are, 90th and Roosevelt, there's a lot of. Ecuadorians, there's a lot of Mexicans and um, some Peruvians because we're here. <laughs> um, so our neighbors are mostly Ecuadorian and Mexican and they're making their dishes and we often eat each other's food. I mean, it's, it's like we try it out, we talk to each other because we do support each other. Across the East River and into Midtown, 
A man named Modu from Senegal sells scarves and hats. I'm here like uh, five years, six years. Only this one I sell, a hat, a scarf, you know. And many time I come, I serve. I don't have time. You know, I work sometimes, I'm, I'm an old man. I'm sometimes, you know, I come late. Sometimes I come early. Everybody know me, I know. A man named Fee Rose sells on a popular corner on Avenue of the Americas. He's from Bangladesh. When I come to America first time, I'm used to work in the restaurant. And when I'm working in the restaurant, one of my friends just tell me, beginning I'm working the fruit cart. This is myself, I'm using the fruit cart. After work, one of my friends said, Feroz, you can make chicken over rice is good business. If you interest, I can help you. 13 years later, and lots of chicken over rice, Feroz is a seasoned street vendor. You've had this truck for 13 years. Have any of your customers become friends? Oh yeah, I have a lot of friends now. Lot of friends, I have customer, and when is some customer coming, I know what kind of food like this, those people. These people then didn't say anything. Just say, Firuz, I'm here, and I understand what kind of food he like it. So of the 1,800 members of the Street Vendor Project, about what percentage would you say have received fines or violations? Oh my God, every single, I feel like every single vendor has come in with um, either a fine or a ticket that's been issued. And that's part of what we do at the Street Vendor Project is we have a legal team um, who will work with each vendor about their tickets. Since you're not able to get a permit to legally work, this leaves people vulnerable to harassment by the NYPD, by the Department of Sanitation, by the Department of Health, um, folks who are out there patrolling city streets and watching to see um, you know, street vendors are very vulnerable because they're out here very public, very present. I love the community that we have. Like every customer is like family to us and our food is like family. It's what we would cook for our family gatherings, for people's birthdays. And so we want to really stay true to the traditional taste of what food is like and it has a lot of love. Street vendors are an integral part of New York City life. Despite the challenges, we expect them to not only survive, but thrive. For CityWorks, I'm Demetria Irwin. There may be some relief in sight. A bill before the city council would lift the cap on the number of food vending permits issued by the city by 400 per year for the next 10 years. The first permits would go to the people currently on the waiting list and the rest by lottery. The bill would also establish a vendor advisory board to receive input from vendors. So much more to report on there. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies is the 25th and newest school under the CUNY umbrella. Dedicated to public service and social justice, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in the areas of labor studies and urban studies and certificate programs in labor relations, public administration and public policy, healthcare policy and administration, and community leadership. We pride ourselves on being an institution that brings together activists and academics. Find out more at slu.cuny.edu. CityWorks reporter Tiwa Chang took a look at the settlement in the GM auto workers' strike. This is what he found. For nearly six weeks this fall, 46,000 GM UAW union workers went on strike. This was the first nationwide auto strike against General Motors since 1970. It cost GM $3 billion and UAW workers nearly $450 million in wages. When the strike ended, the UAW GM agreement gave both sides key demands. The agreement gave workers 3% wage increases, kept worker health care costs at 3%, created a pathway for temporary workers to gain regular status, and GM committed to nearly $8 billion in U.S. plant investments. GM got to keep closed large production plants in Lordstown, Ohio, Dearborn, Michigan, and Baltimore, Maryland, and continue outsourcing to Mexico. The United Auto Workers GM agreement was the template for the Ford UAW settlement and the expected Fiat Chrysler UAW negotiations. Altogether, the U.S. auto industry employs 10 million workers, one out of every 20 private sector workers in America. 
2019 has seen more union action than in 20 years. Most notably, the recent GM auto workers strike, one of the biggest in decades. To talk about all this, we have Beverly Brakeman, Regional Director of UAW Region 9A, which covers New York, all of New England, and Puerto Rico, and veteran investigative reporter and former UAW member, Tiwa Chang. So you're going to go through the details for us, Tiwa, and I appreciate that. The key elements of this agreement that the workers came away with, what are they? Well, uh, in addition to the health care issue, which was uh, maintained a medical cost of 3% for the uh, UAW GM workers, which is very low, the wages went up from $27 up to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Brakeman, uh, to $32. $32.13, if I remember. The other issue I think that was really um, great about this strike is you heard from a lot of the older, longer-term members that they were really out there um, for their younger, um, the younger workers who were either in temporary status or wage progression status. So there was a real solidarity on the picket lines around this strike. But another thing, too, that I would ask Ms. Brakeman about is that uh, this about plant closures. Uh, GM was still able to keep the uh, plants in Lordstown, Ohio, in Dearborn, Michigan, and Baltimore, Maryland will remain closed. But GM promised a new electric vehicle factory would be built in Hamtramck, Michigan, which is right actually surrounded by Detroit. And, and this new plant would employ 2,000 workers. But how many workers would still be lost? And for, for GM, how important are the closures of these plants to maintain competitiveness with other car companies? I think GM would tell you, I mean, I don't think there's agreement around that. We were very, um, we worked really hard to keep the three plants open. Um, it's not like the GM isn't going to be building those cars. They're going to be outsourcing that work. And that was a huge point of contention, not just for these workers, but in all manufacturing industry, I think in our country, these large companies making rep like enormous profits are partially able to do that because they outsource the work to other countries where the labor is cheaper and the health and safety standards are not as as strict or as enforced. Beverly Brakeman, thank you so much from Region 9A and T. Wa Chang, thank you so much for your reporting. Great to be here. Vinny Alvarez may lead the New York City Central Labor Council, but his voice is heard far beyond Gotham's boundaries. He speaks up for labor, organized and otherwise. Thank you for coming into the studio. Great to, great to have you on CityWorks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Laura. So we did a story not so long ago about the um, labor school's report on union density, and it followed the trend that we've been seeing of union density being better in New York um, than elsewhere. Why do you think there is that difference? Why do you think New York's doing better than so many places? Well, I, it's tied to certainly to the strength, the traditional strength, the, the uh, um, um, just the culture of New York City to, to support organizing and activism and, and pushing back. And we can go back to to some of the, uh, the high profile struggles that the garment workers had in the early in the early 20th century and what that meant not only for New York City and organized workers in New York City, but for working people throughout, throughout the country and worker safety uh, for sure. So I think that's part of it. It's the institutional strength, the organizational strength, the leadership that we've had, terrific unions. You've seen them in the fight uh, that they've had recently on the public sector side, trying to strip away those rights throughout the country, but then more recently with the legal fights. Yeah. Um, look, they, they answered and responded to the call, the public sector unions, the teachers, AFSCME, other unions that represent public sector workers, communication workers reaching out, reconnecting with their workers, and those workers overwhelmingly have reaffirmed their support for the unions. So you're responding to the Supreme Court decision, yep. Janus, which stripped in many ways the union's sure. ability to um, sort of de facto increase their revenues through checks, you know, through, through membership, putting more burden on them to do organizing, but you say that they're kind of rising to it. They absolutely have. So when we talk about those numbers, and the other thing which we have to layer on those numbers is the high watermark for unions in this country and support for unions in this country, over 60 percent, I think it's 64 percent in, in the last Gallup poll. That's like a 20-year 20 20 year high yeah. watermark. 
The other things that, that's under 20 year high is union action, especially strike action. And while up to now it had been largely public sector, this fall we saw private sector with respect to the auto workers. There's been others too, hotel workers. Um, the teachers obviously in Chicago scoring a victory in the sense that they forced the mayor to come up with money they said she said didn't exist. When is that going to hit New York? Well, I, I saw you out there on the you know rally for the MTA workers. Yeah, sure, we're out there and, and rally for the MTA workers on the same day, a couple blocks away in front of City Hall, helping to uh, push for a contract with the uh, Council Supervisor Administrators that represent principals here in the city. So there's there is uh, a lot of action and um, activities which are which are taking place in support of activism. Mm -hmm. But let's just look at what you said, which is really important. Uh, last year in this country, over 400,000 workers engaged in strikes. That's the highest number since 1986. Last week, we had 86,000 workers on strike in 13, in, in I think it's over 13 states throughout the country. So these are big numbers. What's leading to this activism? I think, firstly, let's just say I think that activism is good. Right. Whether it be CTU that we saw, the UAW, as you, as you mentioned. And, and, and just to put a pin on it, it's not just activism showing up and talking, it's strike action we're talking about in lots of these cases. Yes. It's strike action, and it's strike action not only for the economic benefit for the workers who feel that they've been left with no recourse to strike, because let's be clear, going out on strike is a very, very difficult choice for workers. Last no, right, no worker wants to go out on strike, you know, but at the same token, they realize sometimes they have no choice, and that, I think, is in the case for some of these workers, but it's not just about their own economic well-being. It's about the economic well-being for, for the communities in which they live. It's dealing with, uh, with other issues about housing and the cost of housing. It's about getting money into the classrooms in the case of, 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 of certainly with, with some of the teacher strike and making sure that we're funding education mm -hmm. in the way that helps teachers do the job that they want to do and students actually learn and, and have supportive staff in those, in those schools. So these are a lot of a lot of important things that we're seeing around and it's all based around activism which I think is a good thing and we're going to continue to support it here in the city as well. Didn't explain why you think it's happening. People just been pushed too far and they're stopping. Bigger, you know, lower unemployment gives people a little bit more confidence. What is it? Well, I think we got to be careful when we start reading too much into the economic numbers because they paint a little bit too much of a rosy picture than what everyday working right. people are feeling. I think after four decades of wages being suppressed, of losing their representation to have a voice, simply have a voice in the workplace, have a little bit more democracy and a say in their lives and the economic well-being of themselves and their families and their communities, I think they start to hit a breaking point. Yeah. Um, they've seen uh, both parties at times, um, both of the two major parties in the, in the country, really uh, not act in, in their best interest, but in the interest of, uh, of corporations that have just endless supplies of money to support uh, an agenda that is not going to work to the betterment of everyday working class mm -hmm. folks. So you hit a wall, and at a certain point you say, we're going to go out and we're going uh, to hit the line. I'm going to push back. I also want to suggest there's a whole new young generation getting involved in organizing. It used to be, you know, we were relying on people that had been in the movement for a while. People would talk about their parents, their grandparents. There's a whole non another young generation who are excited about getting involved in strikes for the first time that I've seen in 20 years. And some of them are organizing, are organizing new workplaces, right. digital workplaces, uh, and other sort of gig workers. How do you relate to that in that that's not traditional union structure for the most part? Well, I think we're working on, number one, working on using the political, using our own organizational, um, the strengths of our institutions and our organization that we've had for over 100 years in the country. Making sure that part of the, when, we're, when we are advocating for our own benefits, that we're making sure that we're, we're advocating as well for the benefits that would, uh, that would help these workers who were quite often misclassified. Some of them are just freelancers as well and, and are doing good work, but but they're having to deal with the issues of the high cost of housing, uh, inadequate health benefits and, and, and access to affordable health benefits, of dealing with the lack of retirement security. Here in New York City, 65% excuse me, of workers in New York City have no form of retirement security whatsoever. No 401k, no traditional defined benefit plan. And that's a crisis for New York City. Yeah, for all of us. So, so 
If you look at like even the, the, the federal legislation that we're supporting, the Protecting Right to Organize Act, that does a lot of good things, but one of the things it also does is it addresses those workers by saying we want to have a, a standard. It's similar to the California legislation, the ABC uh, test, but it says we want to have a standard that, that reflects who really is an employee in an organization and who is not because we know that the benefits mm -hmm. that are afforded to people who are recognized as employees in an organization are much greater. So we're, we're supporting their efforts and we're reaching out and we're talking with them and we have unions as well that are trying to organize them in, in different constructs and different forms. All right, so you said the dread word federal mm -hmm. and made me think about the national scene. How are you thinking about union power going into this so critical election year? Well, the first thing I would say is I'm optimistic in the sense that I've heard presidential candidates um, that are out there on the campaign trail right now on the Democratic side talk more about not only the rights of workers, but the benefits of belonging to a mm -hmm. union, having a collective representation in the workplace, and going further than I've ever seen in my adult lifetime. And I think that's a good thing that they're talking about that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, I would say, you talked about four years ago and support for the, the non-traditional candidates, whether union members who supported Trump or union members who were out there supporting um, Bernie Sanders. I do think that there is a level of frustration, and it's tied to, we talked about why are people striking. There's a level of frustration. It's 40 years of... of, of, of same old, same old. Yeah, same old that they've been dealing with. And it's, it's seeing how government has not responded to just basic needs of everyday working class people that they are responding to people outside of the traditional political establishment, whether that be uh, a Trump type candidate or whether that be uh, Bernie Sanders. And is that what we saw in the 1919, just past the off-cycle off elections? Um, I think so. Some I think amazing things happened. Some amazing things happened. We, uh, on a few different levels, in addition to, I, I talked to my colleagues down in Virginia and, and that state house turning towards uh, having much more pro worker forces now, but we also had uh, labor union candidates that continued to run for office, which I think is a good thing, um, and we support that. We had over 400 labor union members throughout the country uh, that were elected to various levels of Go office. Go on, say that again, just for, under, uh, for Over emphasis. 400, they did a great job. We've had so many different uh, unions. They were led by, we have uh, members of teachers, over, over 60 members of teachers that became elected officials in various levels of government, in states through, in cities throughout the country. That's a good thing that we have working people's voices out there. Um, it adds a whole other element to the discussion when decisions are being made each and every day about the well-being of, of everyday people, working people. Benny, thank you so very much. It's great having you great on City here. Works. Some New York City workers work in high-rise office buildings. Others work outside the city streets. And then there are those who still scratch out a living underground. With just the swipe of a Metro card, you can gain a front seat to some very fine opera in New York. Soprano Alexis Krager builds an audience and makes a modest income amidst the screech and roar of the city subways. I've been performing since I was about 13, 14 years old. I, uh, I just loved it so much, you know, and so I wound up going to school for uh, opera at the Eastman School of Music. Uh, and I've really been performing my whole life. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of sounds that you have to deal with in the subway. Obviously, there's the trains, there's the people walking by, there's people who think they're funny. <laughs> you know? um, but honestly, the acoustic down here is generally fantastic. A lot of us are coming from day jobs, I, I'm included in that, um, you know, and you're just kind of doing your regular everyday drudgery, if you will, and uh, it's just, it's so nice to get back to your passion, you know, to delve down and like connect with your gut and connect with just your heart and get to spread that. Um, so. Really, I have had periods of time working here in the city where I didn't have a regular day job and my primary source of income was singing. I would say it was probably about half my income at one point. Um, I'd say that was probably about four or five years ago. It was, uh, it was a really good chunk of it. Um, really made it possible to stay here in the city. I did start performing with smaller companies around the city. I started singing with Chelsea Opera, with Regina Opera, with Amore Opera, etc. But it didn't give me enough opportunity to get out and sing to people. 
because that's what you love as a performer that's your mission really you know to get out and perform and sing and have that love thrown back at you <laughs> you know you'll have a slow night here and there but generally speaking people are really generous um, and it it helps seeing the tips in the bucket you know just kind of reinforces that you're doing a good job <laughs> and you're doing the right thing it's 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 fun it's fun to sing in the subway School of Labor and Urban Studies. Thanks for watching CityWorks. I'm Laura Flanders.